All right, so we're live, guys. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm grateful you all were able to make it to our last class. I'm sorry that last month we weren't able to meet and we weren't able to actually go out. So that's why there's an opportunity next, uh, not next month, but the following month in July. And don't, don't think of it as you got to share the gospel with someone. Think of it as just getting your feet wet, going there and just passing out gospel tracts and just saying hello. It doesn't have to be uh, an anxiety attack where you're, oh, no, i got to talk with someone. Think of it in more um, baby steps, me talking with someone, just saying hello, giving out gospel tracts. And then if you feel led to try and actually talk with someone and share the gospel, and you will see open air preaching. So there's going to be some street preaching. You'll see that too. So if you haven't been exposed to that, the type of preaching that's sound and biblical and not just screaming, you know, you're all going to hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll be able to experience that. I've invited one of my friends, uh, Paul, to come out. And um, it'll, be a, it'll be sweet fellowship and blessing. So I do hope you guys can all come out. So with that said, we'll get started. I know we have a small class today, but that means more time for us to have some uh, personal questions answered if, if, uh, if you have any. So I'll pass out the notes. I have some notes here. And since we don't have very many people here, everyone can have their own personal <laughs> notes. Okay, so there's you guys some notes. There's you guys some notes. Um, I think I, yeah, I think I, I believe I, all right, so before we begin, we'll go ahead and open up in prayer, and then we'll get started. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us as we endeavor to study apologetics as it relates to evangelism. May the study be profitable. May we go forth in humility. And may we emphasize that our task is to declare the gospel clearly and to defend it from Scripture. And we know that you are the one that saves, not us. Uh, we're, we're in a, a spiritual battle. And it's not won by crafty arguments by us but it's won by your Holy Spirit changing hearts and us faithfully proclaiming the gospel and being clear and persuasive as, as we can by your grace. We ask that you'd bless, um, even in my feeble attempts, um, what we discuss and bless our afternoon, our noon and afternoon. <laughs> we ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So the topic today is apologetics, and I know that at some it can come across as daunting and overwhelming, so I, I try to make it simple, but we do get into some deep water. So I will do my best to simplify the parts that are deep, okay? So let's go ahead and pull up my notes here, and before we begin, I'll just quickly... Um, make a few points about the notes. So on the very back of your notes, you're going to see something that I personally uh, wrote out. And this is kind of a chart. Uh, this is a, a mind map or a web to show influences. Because who, what I'm going to argue for is an apologetic school or method that is influenced by Cornelius Van Til and Gordon H. Clark, and to see where are they getting their stuff from, where are they learning these ideas from, I kind of track it out so you guys can see the influences of, of Dr. Clark and Dr. Van Til. Um, we'll discuss it more, but I do want you to just highlight that I did put this in your notes because I personally want to know. It's kind of like martial arts. I don't know if any of you are in martial arts, but in martial arts, it's very important to know who you are learning from and who is their teacher. It's very important because there has to be a lineage to kind of understand, you know, is this 
legitimately effective, right? And it's the same in apologetics. It is important to know who you are learning from, and um, because some apologists, some people, some teachers are going to be more sound biblically than others, and that's why I put that in there. And also, just so that you can see, if you're familiar with any of these names, you can see who influences who. All right. So we'll, we'll talk about it more. Um, and I should just mention as a preliminary remark, and I already kind of hinted at it, or actually I explicitly said it. So what I'm going to be arguing for is an apologetic method that is presuppositional. And we're going to define all these terms. And the, the person that I'm most influenced by on this chart is actually going to be Gordon H. Clark and um, Greg Bonson and John Frame. So the people on this chart you're going to see who I'm more influenced by because I've read them more. I'm more, I agree a lot more with some of the things that they say, just weighing it from scripture, thinking about it hard. So that's going to be helpful. But I bring all this to say that our ultimate standard for apologetics is going to be scripture. And the reason why I would put my name next to any of those men on the, on the chart is because I think they're more faithful to scripture. If that makes sense. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and get started. So apologetics. If you have a Bible, turn with me to 1 Peter 3.15. If you don't have a Bible, I do have some right here. Anyone need a Bible? So this is going to be the New American Standard. Um, so if that's okay. So 1 Peter 3.15. And if you do not know this verse, I recommend you memorize it because this is going to be one of the, the common texts that we would go to to discuss apologetics. So 1 Peter 3.15, I'll just give you the context quickly because normally we just jump into it. So this time I actually have the context prepared. So in this epistle... In this epistle, Peter is addressing Christians scattered abroad in Asia Minor. And they're in Roman provinces. And the purpose of the letter is Paul is encouraging Christians to endure suffering and persecution. So that is the context where we find ourselves in this text. And God, through Peter, writes, verse 15, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Now, we are commanded in this verse, in verse 15, we are to set Christ apart as holy. Christ is to be honored as Lord in our hearts. And so this is connected with defending the faith. When we defend the faith, we need to make it explicit that Christ is our Lord and Savior. He is our Lord and Savior. And the term prepared, it means to be ready, right? Um, always uh, standing by. Think of like a fireman, ready to go, right? The necessary preparations are done. And then in verse 15, this is where we get this term defense. It's the Greek word apologia. I don't know if anybody of you guys watch YouTube, but there's a church called Apologia with Jeff Durbin. Well, it's actually apologia, or you could say apologia, but it's, it's yeah, it's, uh, yeah it's, it's, it's not apologia, it's apologia, okay? And it's from the Greek... The Greek term, if we break it down, apa meaning off or from, and legain, which means to speak. So it's this idea that you speak from a certain position to defend it. It's a well-reasoned reply. Often the term is used for, it, it's associated to, uh, in a courtroom, you make an apology, you make a defense in the courtroom. If any of you guys have studied the works of Plato, there is an actual dialogue called the apology, right? And it has to do with Socrates and um, him having to go before the court 
right? Apology, uh, apology means defense. It doesn't mean saying you're sorry in Greek. It means defending. And this is where we get the term apologetics from. It's, de it's derived from this Greek word. And in this verse, we see that there is an imperative in the Greek that we are commanded to defend the faith. This is something that we're commanded to do. Everybody, all Christians. So, a definition. Apologetics, and this is a general definition. Apologetics is a rational defense of the Christian faith. There are other definitions that can be provided. Um, just off the top of my head, I know that William Lane Craig says that defending the truth claims of Christianity, I know that Cornelius Van Til, he talks about the vindication of, of Christianity. Those are all helpful definitions as well. Let's continue. Apologetics, according to Dr. John Frame, has three elements. Proof, rational confirmation for faith, defense, replies to criticisms, and offense, bringing criticisms against non-Christian ideas. Each of these contributes to the others so that the three elements, the three elements cannot be sharply separated. And in your notes, I put down the verses that this is biblical. These um, prove Defense, offense, these are biblical ideas. And so I put in your, in, your, in your notes the scriptural verses that you can look back through to see that this is biblical. Um, and looking still at the verse that we uh, were in, so in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through uh, 16, notice it says we are, to be, we are to have gentleness, respect. We're supposed to have gentleness, that is to say humility, we're not supposed to be prideful or puffed up with knowledge. We're also sp supposed to be respectful. This person is made in the image of God that we're talking to. And then finally, behavior. Our lifestyle is to reflect Christ. It's not to reflect Satan and the devil. It's supposed to reflect Christ. So the definition of apologetics we've provided. Now let's continue because... It's been like three months since we've talked about worldview. So I put in a definition again to remind us to think about talking to people in terms of worldviews. Because the person that you talk to probably has a different set of beliefs than you. So we need to be cognizant of that fact. So what is a worldview? A worldview, a worldview is a set of basic beliefs that define, describe, and interpret reality. And by reality, I'm talking about human thought, experience, values, right? And what, what, what is an example of this? So John Calvin talks about spectacles, right? We don't usually talk about spectacles. We use the term glasses, right? So when you're wearing glasses, and I'm just going to do this just for fun, right? I do this with my kid. So when you have glasses on, right? <laughs> right? When you have glasses on, you see the world through those glasses. If you have contacts, contact lenses on, they're going to give you sharper focus in the world, what you can see. Well, depending upon what color your glasses are will dictate how you see the world. If your glasses are blue, you're going to see everything blue. If your glasses are red, you're going to see everything red. Worldviews are like glasses. We look and interpret the world. It's like a filter that we interpret the world through. And it's important to understand what that entails. What that entails is, is that there are no worldview independent facts or evidences. Every worldview has a core, a, a core beliefs that function as the final standard for evaluating truth and reason. So you can't point to a piece of evidence and you say, look at this. This is evidence that um, Christianity is true. What are they going to do? They're going to use their worldview to interpret that fact consistent with their worldview. So we can't just talk about facts with people. We have to do more than that. We have to challenge their worldview. We have to challenge their, their basic beliefs that they're using as their standard of truth. So what's a presupposition? I use this term already um, multiple times. So there are two, two ways to define a presupposition. And... 
I take this from James N. Anderson. I should just note that a lot of my material, I am using some of it from James N. Anderson. I try to highlight it in my notes as a footnote. So presuppositions. Objective, an objective presupposition is a statement or claim that must be true for any other statement or claim to be true. So what would be an example? Well, um, one example is um, that would typically be used. Um, so <clears throat> this is a super easy, right? But um, in order for uh, <clears throat> to do mathematics, right? One equals one, two equals two, three equals three. And this all must be true in order for you to have one, two, three, four, five. And then also to be able to use that to say two plus two equals four, right? Now, let's get out of the math realm because math is not my area of specialization at all. I am not a mathematician. I did not study math deeply. Um, but how about, how about logic, right? Um, so if we say, um, if P, then Q, P, therefore Q, right? And we, you can, you know, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, right? So we, we use this type of logic all the time. This is called a modus ponens. Um, why do I bring this up? Because you have, to, you have to, if you presuppose the standards of logic, then what's going to happen is when you make a, you, you have to take this as true, logic, and then once you take it as true, you're able to use it to reason, right? Or maybe a more fundamental basic example is we assume that our, our five senses are reliable, right? Generally reliable. So I can, if there's something in my eye, I can use my eye to take whatever, whatever, let's say something gets in my eye. I can use my eye, trust that it's reliable to take whatever's in it out of it, right? So those are presuppositions that we use and they must be true in order for other things to be true. And I know it's kind of deep, but I hope it helps highlight what I'm trying to get at. To make that practical, mm -hmm. I actually was, well, I was drinking more than I should have, I was evangelizing with this lady who was hanging out with my friends, and she, when she couldn't defend anymore, said, well, maybe reality is not real. How do you know this science is, how do we know any of this is real? So it's not like, it sounds fancy, enough, but you will actually get that from normal people on the street. Well, how do you know what you smell, touch, taste, see? How do I know that the sky is real, the trees are real? Right. So you, can, you will actually get that on the street. Yeah, it's kind of like this. It's, I've heard it as a joke, but this, these are serious philosophical questions. Someone can ask you, you know, how do you know that I exist? And then you look back at him and you say, who just asked me the question, you know, right? So they're, they're, they have to presuppose that they exist in order to ask the question in order to even make sense of them being able to ask the question. So these are objective presuppositions. But then there's also subjective presuppositions, which are basic assumptions that guides and controls our beliefs, judgments, reasoning, and interpretation of evidence. And that's why we need to, we need to in our apologetics, we don't want to focus on just the facts. We want to focus on the presuppositions. That's where we want to focus our attack what we want to focus our target on. And I'll, I'll speak more to that. We talked about the Christian worldview months ago. So just quickly, and I've just put down some of the basic beliefs that we have in, as a Christian worldview. So the sufficiency, clarity, authority, inerrancy, and necessity of scripture. So scripture, we, we believe in sola scriptura, that scripture is our final authority. Is it our only authority? Well, no, I mean, we use reason, we use our five senses, but those things are all subordinate to Scripture. Scripture gets the final say. It's the final court of, the, of appeal. Right now, the Supreme Court's talking about Roe versus Wade, right? The Supreme Court is supposed to be the final authority. So if they make the rule that says, you know, we're going to rescind it, then it should be the law of the land, and nobody should be able to question it. And Congress should not be able to pass a bill and... Right? Supreme Court should say, that's it. 
it's done. Well, in the same in the same way, for the Christian worldview, Scripture is the final court of appeal. We believe in the Trinity that God is one God that is three persons. Um, we believe in creation from nothing that God created everything and everything depends upon God. Humans are made in the image of humans are made in the image of God with intrinsic value and worth. Humans are radically corrupt by the sin of Adam. We believe in total depravity in our church. We believe in the incarnation, that Christ is very God and very man. We believe in the substitutionary atonement and bodily resurrection of Christ. And I didn't put in my notes here, but we also believe in the virgin birth. Um, I couldn't fit everything, and, and I didn't think about it until later. Uh, we believe in salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. We're not, we're not saved by works. And we believe in the future physical return of Christ. So these are just some quick basic uh, beliefs that Christians have. Now, if you remember the acronym TAKES that we use to talk about worldviews, you're going to see how all these fit in one of those categories. TAKES. You, know, you guys remember TAKES? TAKES. Theology, anthropology, knowledge, ethics, salvation. Everything, all those beliefs that we just cited, they're going to fit in one of these categories. And that's why it's very helpful to remember this acronym so that when you're talking to people, you can think, okay, what are they saying? Okay, they're saying that, um, they're saying that all the, all, the whole world is God. Okay, they think the whole world is God. Okay, then that's their view of theology, right? And then how does that affect the way that they understand man? Well, that means I'm God too, right? Well, if I'm God, then how do I get saved? What does it even mean to be saved, right? And why, why does it matter if I punch you? Right? If you're God and I'm God, well, then I'm going to beat you up because I'm God and you're God. Right? So you get you, you, what I'm saying is you think in terms of this acronym and it will help you in categorizing people's beliefs. And it will help you in your own mind to kind of take inventory. Right? All right. So we've talked about a worldview. We've talked about presuppositions. Now we're ready to talk about what is the purpose of apologetics? People get this misconception that apologetics is about arguing people into the kingdom, right? I'm going to convince you that Christianity is true, and then you'll become a Christian, right? Well, go ahead. Um, yeah, you started earlier by saying we're going to be basing it on the uh, presupposition methods of apologetics. Mm -hmm. um, how about it? Have you, how, how, what's your take in terms of the classical? Well, it's, it's in your notes. Yeah, we're getting to it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the purpose, oh, you're good, you're good. No, it, it's good. Um, I'm glad that you asked because we, we do need to address that. So um, capital letter B in your outline, the purpose of apologetics. The purpose, the overriding, overarching purpose is to glorify God. That is it. Minimally, or, you know, minimally, that's it. All the other purposes can be, you know, secondary, but that's the primary purpose, is to glorify God. Secondly, it's to silence non-Christians. Put them to shame. Does that mean make fun of them? No. Does that mean humiliate them? No. What that means is show that their worldview leads to absurdity. You guys remember when we used the taking the roof off tactic? Well, we want to do that. We want to take the roof off their worldview and show your worldview is a dead end. It leads, you, it leads you away from God, and it leaves you in darkness. Right? So silence non-Christians. Uh, number three. So, so number three, evangelize non-Christians. Clarify doctrines and answer objections with the hope that God will change the non-Christian's heart. And then fourth, edify the church and Christians. Help deal with doubts and build confidence of Christians. And then fifth, protect the church and Christians. Uh, our, our shepherds, our, our pastors, are to protect the sheep, but we too, as Christians, want to protect the church and protect our families from false teaching. And then number six, promote theological insight and precision. When we talk about um, our, our worldview, we want to think theologically, we want to think Christianly, right? And then finally, the seventh, develop critical thinking skills. Christianity teaches that God is the source of logic, okay? And so, since God is the source of logic, 
we do want to think God's thoughts after him. So we want to, we, we want to promote critical thinking and we want to be able to, um, you can sit anywhere you like. Here's our, here's our lecture notes. We're at capital letter B. Yeah. So we, we want to think, we want to think hard about um, not only what we believe, but why we believe it. And that's, that's, that's what apologetics is all about. And so we want to develop critical thinking skills and apologetics does help with that. So now we're at capital letter C. So it should be page, page two. So page two, capital letter C. So implications of the Christian worldview in apologetics. So the first implication is apologetics should presuppose God is the creator and sustainer of all things. We don't come into an argument or discussion um, as though we don't believe in God, right? I'm going to, I don't believe in, you know, oh, okay, let me, let me hear what you have to say. Okay. And pretend like you're neutral on the matter. Pretend that you're tentative on your beliefs. Well, no, we, we, we do, we do want to be upfront that we believe that God is the creator and sustainer. And so, um, Cornelius Van Til would put this on the board. So he, uh, he would put this circle, and then he would put this one right here. And he would say, <clears throat> God, this circle is to represent God, and this circle is to represent creation. And I forget, there's like this, there's a, I think there's a, it's a German term that he uses, and I'm not, it's like spredunct, I, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, okay, but it's the idea that God is the one that created everything, and he is the one that sustains it, and he is different than creation, okay, we, this is very important to understand that, that God is the source, and he is the one that sustains creation, so we could put it this way, creation derives and depends upon God. God does not depend upon creation. And this is really important because in apologetics, sometimes people make it sound like God and creation are all the same thing. That, you know, God and create, God is here and creation's inside God. And that's not what we believe. Um, that would be some sort of, um, it's called panantheism. Right? Panantheism. Pan meaning in and uh, it, yeah, panantheism, not pantheism. Pantheism is different. Pantheism is the idea that everything is God. Panantheism is the idea is it's kind of like this. I'll use a metaphor. Um, God is the soul and the world is the body. That's panantheism. And that's not what we believe. Kind of, yeah. So, so, so that's not that's not what we believe, and so we need to keep this creator creature distinction. We need to make sure that we affirm that in our in our understanding. So we're at capital letter or capital letter C number two. So apologetics should reason from scripture as our starting point, and that's going to be um, we're going to discuss why I think that, but um, that's something that I believe is biblical. And then number three, apologetics should aim to prove the Christian worldview. We're going to compare and contrast our worldview with the non-believers world, the, the non-Christians worldview. Um, what that means is we're not thinking about, okay, let's compare just this belief with this belief. Well, no, 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 because as I stated earlier, we think in terms of our whole worldview. Our worldview is like glasses, and so when we, when we put the glasses on, we see the world through the lens of our worldview. So we need to do worldview comparisons, not one belief comparing it to another belief. And then number four, apologetics should honor Christ's lordship. What does it mean to say that Christ is Lord? It means that Christ's authority, his presence, and his control is over our lives. And so we need to recognize that and affirm that in, in whatever we do, especially in apologetics. We need to honor that. And then number five, apologetics should recognize fallen humanity suffers the noetic effects of sin. This is something that goes with our theology as uh, we affirm the doctrines of grace in our church. We believe the doctrines of grace are biblical, right? We believe in God's sovereignty. 
And so with that, we believe that man is radically corrupt. They're born sinful, right? What is the, um, I'm, I'm not going to put it up here, but there's, there's, St. Augustine talks about the four stages of man. And what stage is everyone at when they're born? Sinful, fallen. And sin affects, it permeates even the intellect of an individual. So what that means is everyone is intellectual rebels against God. Everyone is a, a rebel against God. If they're a non-Christian, they're a rebel against God. And they habitually, that is to say continually, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. How is that possible? Well, it's, we have a term for that. It's called self-deception. That's how someone can consistently deny God and also affirm God at the same time. That's how it's possible. Just like um, a concrete example would be, a, um, and I, I know this is a horrible example, but say that there is a wife that is getting beat by their husband, right? It's a common thing that women will say, you know, he really loves me. He really loves me. And then this guy, the husband keeps beating her, but she keeps believing the lie that he doesn't, that he cares about her and that he loves her. And so she has two contradictory beliefs, right? That he loves me, but he also doesn't love me. She knows in her heart that, you know, he doesn't really love me because if he does, he wouldn't treat me this way. So she, she is deceiving herself about the situation. And that's what the non-Christian does, is he truly does know God exists. God has put that truth in all of our hearts. Um, Calvin talks about this called the sensus divinitatis. It's this idea that we all have this innate knowledge of God. Now, how does it manifest itself? Well, we can talk about that, but we all have this knowledge, and the non-Christian suppresses it, holds it down. And... Um, I should just put it here that Cornelius Van Til uses this example. He says, imagine a, a father sitting down and the, uh, the father has their daughter sitting on the father's lap. Okay. And while the daughter is in the father's lap, the daughter goes to smack the father in the face. Well, the idea is that in order for this daughter to be able to smack the father, she must be in the Father's lap. Well, in order for the non-Christian to deny God's existence, God must be the one that's controlling and preserving that person's life and giving them everything that they have in order for them to be able to do that. And we also have to say, in some sense, that they have that knowledge. I can't, I can't imagine a daughter not knowing their, anything about their father whatsoever and being able to smack them and be in that situation. Maybe they have um, some type of uh, amnesia or something like that. We could think of, we could think of scenarios, right? But, but uh, the purpose, the, 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 the illustration highlights that we have to presuppose God in order to deny God, right? And we're going to discuss that even further. So acknowledge that non-Christians suffer the noetic effects of sin, intellectual rebellion, and then number six, apologetics should recognize our point of contact, our common ground, not neutral ground, in apologetics is the reality that all of humanity is made in the image of God. We're all made in the image of God. That's how we can be able to talk to people. And that's, that's how people can have knowledge, that we can say that the non-Christian has knowledge just as much as we do. All truth is God's truth, but we have to realize that truth is not neutral, right? We see truth in terms of our worldview, and our worldview paints truth in a specific color. And the correct color is the color of Christianity, right? The correct worldview is Christianity. But the way that we're going to be able to talk to people is because they're made in the image of God, they have the knowledge of God in them, and they act, even though they, in their minds and in their hearts, they, they, um, they have... Um, their belief and their behavior is inconsistent because they say that they don't believe in God or they say that they believe some other God, right? Some other idol. But when they live their lives, they act as Christians. And why is that? Because they're living in self-deception and God has put the truth in their hearts about his, his existence. And so we're going, to want to, we're going to want to use that fact that they're made in the, in the image of God 
as our common ground, our point of contact. So capital letter D, the method of apologetics. And this is where we're going to get into some of the, the debates, right? But I want to say that in evangelism, we seek to be faithful to Scripture and proclaim the gospel to the glory of God. Likewise, in apologetics, we are to strive to defend the faith consistently with Scripture in honor of Christ. We want to make Christ preeminent, not only in our evangelism, but also in our apologetics. He is to have our allegiance and honor. Now, there are two main competing methods of apologetics. There are actually a lot more. There's like five or six. But I don't want, uh, it's not that I don't want to go through it. It's that I don't have the time. So what I would suggest is picking up this book called Five Views on Apologetics so you can dig deeper. Five Views on Apologetics. Because we just don't have the time to go through all of them. Okay? But I have put down the two main, the two main apologetic methods. And then I also wanted to recommend that there's actually a, um, I'll give you guys the information, but there is an app you can download by Reformed Theological Seminary, and it goes through all of the, um, the methods. So the Reformed Theological Seminary, um, you can get the app on your phone for free. Reformed Theological Seminary, RTS. And um, if you get the one, you get, get the app, you can listen to um, John Frame's lectures, and you can also listen to James and Anderson's lectures, and they go through all of the different schools uh, or different methods of apologetics, but this book's going to be very helpful. And if you want to borrow it, just let me know, and I can let you borrow it. So we're going to go through two of them, and I'm going to be critical of the first one. So I, I already told you I'm biased, right? I have presuppositions, right? I'm not religiously neutral at all, okay? None of us are. So number one, classical method. So this method may be summarized in the motto, I understand and I believe. The classical method starting point is human reason is a sufficient, neutral guide for truth. The emphasis is reasoning to God independently from scripture with the tools of philosophy to build natural theology. Now that term natural theology needs to be defined Natural theology. So the emphasis is on this idea, natural. So natural theology is this. It is a, I would say it is discursive, inferential, it's discursive, inferential. What, what can we say? It's using the tools of philosophy to construct arguments as proof for God. So it's discursive, it's inferential. Um, the, the way that I can think of it is um, it's, it's formulating arguments. Formul, formulating arguments. Maybe I save logical arguments, but yeah, formulating arguments um, independent, independent of scripture, independent of, um, yeah, independent of scripture. So it's, it's using the tools of philosophy. And this is, this is, um, I could give you guys an example of an argument. So one of the most, um, well-known arguments today, today in the 21st century is called the Kalam this is a Muslim term, which means um, speech, but it goes something like this. Whatever begins to exist, so whatever begins to exist has a cause. All right, so that's the first premise. Second premise, the universe began to exist. I'm just going to put began. The universe began to exist. And then the conclusion is, therefore, the universe has a cause. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. So this is, this is part of natural theology. This is constructing an argument. 
constructing an argument that is independent of scripture to try and prove God's existence. Classical method is a two-step method. Number one, prove general theism. What's general theism? It's just whatever Muslims, Christians, and Jews believe. Right? It's just a general God. It could be any God. Just God. Right? General. And then number two, then you need to prove Christian theism. So it's like step one, prove God exists. Step two, now you need to prove Christianity is true. And how are you going to do that? You're going to do that by talking about the resurrection of Christ with historical facts, uh, talking about the reliability of the New Testament. Um, but notice, these are all appeals to secular. You're going to use secular historians to try and argue for the resurrection. And you're going to use secular um, you're going to use secular um, textual critics to try and argue that the Bible is reliable. You're not going to argue that it's inerrant or that it's, um, you're, you're basically going to argue that it's uh, generally reliable. You're not going to argue that it's the word of God, right? And so you're, you're trying to build some common neutral ground, right? This idea of neutral ground, religious uh, neutrality. The strengths of this method, it promotes consistency and coherence, um, which is very good. That's, that's a good thing. The weaknesses, and this is where I, my criticisms come in. So it downplays the clarity of scripture and the noetic effects of sin. Christ, we, as though, we believe in common grace, okay? But we also have to, we have to grapple with the reality that we, we are sinful. And this method kind of downplays the sinfulness of man. And they kind of, I guess, increase the idea that we, you know, they must have like, we're all able to use our reason and logic well without any, without sin affecting it. And so they, they downplay the noetic effects of sin. And why is that? Because some of these scholars are not, some of them are not, they don't believe in the doctrines of grace. Some of them don't. So that's going to be the reason why, because some of them are Arminians. Um, uh, but Arminians typically do affirm the, to the total depravity. So some of them go beyond Arminianism, like semi-Pelagianism or something like that. Ryan, yeah. Would you say that's not exclusively a method? Like you can use... As you said, people try to distract you in an evangelical conversation one way or the other way. You can use reason, logic, and science to beat points or to deflate arguments and then go back to Scripture. Yes, yeah, that, absolutely. It's not, that this is yeah, I, you, can use, you can use this argument. You just have to do it in a certain way. So we're going to talk about that. I'm not, I'm not opposed to arguments, but I'm, I'm opposed to starting off with the idea that God does not exist and that um, you know we're we're religiously neutral, and that everyone can judge God on their own, right? I'm against that. We are not the judge and jury of God. We are not. And if we if our if our apologetical method makes it sound like that, then something's wrong. And so, but yes, we can use these arguments. We can use reason. We can use logic. We can use science. But we have to do it within the Christian worldview, and we have to do it affirming the Christian worldview. And what does that look like? We'll talk about that. But the great question, great question. Um, the second weakness that I, I put down in, in the notes is that the classical method explicitly or implicitly affirms religious neutrality and human autonomy. So what is that's exactly the point that we were just making here a moment ago, is that the classical method makes it sound like we can start off... Um, that, that our worldviews don't impact how we interpret evidence and that we can come to this, we can go to this argument and we can think of it neutrally and then come to the conclusion that God exists. When in reality, we're interpreting this argument in terms of our worldview. So an atheist, if they look at this argument, they, they may not be convinced um, if, we don't, if we don't argue against their presupposition. Now, I'm going to talk about what would be the presupposition here. Well, um, it's this idea of causality. Or we could say cause and effect, right? Um, that's a presupposition that we would want to challenge, that 
if you deny if you deny the Christian worldview, you're not going to be able to affirm this consistently. And so we would want to actually what this argument presupposes is this, and so we want to focus on this. And I'll, I'll talk more about it, and because um, I don't want to get too off of my notes yet. So we'll talk about this, but. Religious neutrality and human autonomy. What's human autonomy? It's the idea that, that humanity can be the judge and jury of anything. So we can be the judge and jury of God. So we get to put God, metaphorically, we could put God on the court stand and cross-examine God. We're the attorneys. God is, in, God is the one that's on trial. And that's not biblical. We don't put God on trial. We don't test God. God is God and we're not. Um, so we need to make sure that we don't affirm this idea of human autonomy where we think uh, autonomy just means self-law. Auto meaning self, nome means law. And it's the idea that man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. Um, man, it, you know, it's, it's this idea that man is, um, man is the standard of truth and is the gift to the world, right? And that's not right. We're not the standard of truth, and we are not the gift to the world. God is the one that gives the world to us as a gift, not the not the other way around, right? We're we're not we're not you know we're not the gift to God. God gives us gifts; we don't give Him gifts. Okay, and then the last point is often inconsistency. Uh, this this view affirms inconsistently uh, aspects of empiricism, rationalism, and irrationalism. Um, empiricism is the idea that all knowledge comes through the five senses. Rationalism is the idea that all everything should everything should be derived from just reason alone. And then the other one is that everything is derived by emotions or um, experience alone. And you'll get this um, in some like for a, I'll give you a quick example. Thomas Aquinas uh, he. He talks about how God, God is, um, here, here um, I'll put it this way, um, God is above all categories. Categories or gene, genuses, genus, um, species. I'm spelling species wrong. Um, so God is above all categories, okay? And I think I, I think what he's trying to say is that God is God and he's not a creature, right? So I agree with that. God is God and God's not a creature. But when we say that God is above all categories, what that in, what that means is is that God is above language. And so if God is above language, we can't talk about God. We're cut off from God. And so any word that we say is, is um, technically, um, uh, we're, we're, I guess what we're saying is, is if God is above all categories, then no language can be used to talk about God. And we don't know what we're talking about when we say God. Right. You, have a, you have a question? The scripture that comes to mind that would seem to be at least limited, but some pushback on that would be, when Moses asked God his name, he says, I am that I am. He's saying he's, he defies our full comprehension. Certainly. Sure. Our full language ability to grasp his stuff. We can, like, kind of what I was saying before, you can use logic. It'll get you so far. I get what you're saying because the Muslims believe God is beyond reason because God is unreasonable. God is nothing like reason, so you can't use reason to try and understand God. We can re use reason to get so far, just like we need to right. use scripture to get so far. But I would agree that God is above full definition sure we in order to fully know God we'd have to be God right. so I agree with that but the question is 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 our is our language can we actually talk about God and know God yes I think we can yes we can and so this is this sounds irrational to me like if God is above all categories and we can't talk about God we don't know what we're talking about we're in irrational we're, we're you know um, another way to put it is this because um, um, because Aquinas talks about analogy, right? Analogy. So in order for analogy to work, you need to have something that's the same 
in order to bring some to make the point of something a similarity. Okay, so <clears throat> with language, we could say that God, um, you know, God is good, right? And the way that we understand goodness is going to be different if we say that, you know, um, um, you know, I went to the doctor and I'm good, right? Those are different understandings of goodness. But there has to be some type of similar, there has to be something to make the similarity of the term goodness. Something has to be the same. And that similar, that's what has to be the same, has to be the same for God and for us. Now, what is it? Well, the goodness is that God has made everything, right? God is good. He's morally perfect. And he has made us. And when we, when, when our bodies are the way that they were designed to be, it's good. It's the way that God made it to be good. It's perfect in that sense. Not perfect as in like morally perfect, but perfect as in the way it should be, the way that God made it to be. God is the way God is, and he is good perfectly, and he made us a certain way. And my example of goodness, if, I'm, if I go to the doctor and he says I'm good, I have a clean bill, bill of health, my body is functioning the way that it should be, the way that God made it, right? And so what's the same? Well, the term goodness, um, it has a similar element. And maybe I'm going too deep on this, but I could just say this way, is that, um, uh, how can I say this? Um, let's just put it this way. What Scripture says, right? God knows what Scripture says, right? Yeah, yeah. I was looking at it. Since he is the perfection of its hope of his own intellect, therefore... He, he is the truth itself. Right. And since he's the truth itself, so it says the truth is a goodness of the intellect. Sure, you can you can use that. Sure, you can go that route. But what I, I was going to make this point is that um, God, this is this is the mind of God here, this Bible, right? Now the question is, is the mind of God the same as what we read here? Yes. Yes, it is. Same. Is he above all categories? No, because then we couldn't understand what this says. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I have to add that this statement is all about God. God is all about all categories. Yeah. This is saying God is all-knowing, right? I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. But the question is, is um, it goes back to language. Can we talk about God and does it actually, can we really know God? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. But some of these guys make it sound like we can't. Some of the things that they say, you're like, you're scratching your head. Sounds like you're saying nonsense. Um, also, uh, uh, Ryan, of course, when we, uh, you know, when we go and share the gospel and the disciple, you know, nothing in God is by accident. It's all God's plan. Oh, absolutely. So that, that itself, when we go there and we talk to people, God already anoint the time. As Absolutely. We study as we pray, and God's already setting up the pitch festival. Absolutely. For us to go, go share the gospel. Start, Amen. Amen. Right. I agree. I agree. Amen. Amen. And I love the pushback and the interaction. Um, so, who are the key figures of this method? Uh, Thomas Aquinas is going to be the major figure. Um, and then Jonathan Edwards, I have a, my shirt says, uh, nature is God's greatest evangelist, Jonathan Edwards. So Jonathan Edwards, uh, R.C. Sproul, R.C. Sproul, and then William Lane Craig is probably one of the most well-known in the 21st century. Now we're going to move on to the second method, which I think is more biblical. Um, it may be expressed in the motto, I believe in order that I may understand. So that's how we can understand what this, this whole presuppositional method is all about. The starting point of the presuppositional method is the Bible. And the Bible as the final standard for truth. Is it the only standard of truth? No. No, I mean, we, 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 we have the ability to learn mathematics, science, right? But... God's word is the, the final authority, okay? That's, that's what Sola Scriptura is all about. The emphasis is reasoning to God from Scripture as the, tr as the true presupposition necessary to make sense of anything. 
And the example that we, we actually talked about already, um, we can use the example of Descartes. So Descartes, um, he was a um, um, modern philosopher, right? And he's famous for saying this. Um, he said, um, uh, cogito ergo sum, right? In Latin it means um, I think or I doubt. It's more I doubt. But um, we'll use the I think, therefore, I am. Right? Now, I, I put this here because I want to make a point. Okay? So Descartes says, I think, therefore, I am. Right? We can use that and get, illustrate the presuppositional method. Because we can think, God must exist. Now, why is that? Because God is the one that created us, and he's the one that we're dependent upon to exist. It's kind of like the person that says, I don't believe there's such a thing as air. <gasps> air doesn't exist. <gasps> I'm telling you, air doesn't exist. <sighs> All the while breathing. So anytime someone says, you know, God doesn't exist, God is the one that's giving them the breath that they breathe in order for them to exist. That's what the presuppositional method is all about, is showing the necessary presupposition is God in order to make sense of anything. In order for you to exist, God must be the one that created you and sustains you. Yeah. And so that's going to be a good illustration of the presuppositional method. If we wanted to contrast the two, um, there is an, an illustration, um, but because of due to time, I'm just going to keep going. I would recommend you get those lectures by James Anderson because he goes through, he gives the example of, um, it's called the, 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 uh, the binoculars at the beach. Right? That's the example. So we'll keep going. Binoculars at the beach. So how can we, how can we put this method into a step-by-step? -step? So the presuppositional method is a three-step method. Number one, identify non-Christian presuppositions. Number two, show the, inadequ the inadequacy of the non-Christian presuppositions. Um, what does that mean? That means that show that they undermine the possibility of human reasoning and experience without God. If you deny God, you're left in foolishness, right? You're left in darkness. And then third, show the adequacy of the Christian presuppositions. So, that's going to be the three-step method of the presuppositional uh, approach. What are the method strengths? Well, number one, it defends the Christian worldview as an integrative, holistic system. So what are the method strengths? I said, no, it's really answers from the web. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it defends the Christian faith as a system, not as, you know, this belief here and this belief here. Um, it's going to be as a system, and that's good. Uh, secondly, uh, it affirms Christ's lordship and it denies religious neutrality uh, and human autonomy. I try to put all, put all that in one, uh, one sentence. Affirms Christ's lordship, denies human autonomy, and it denies human neutrality or religious neutrality. Right? And then lastly, it consistently affirms the self-authenticating nature of Scripture. What does that mean? That means that it says... Up front, I believe this is the Bible. This is a, I believe in the whole Bible, not a Bible full of holes. And it is the Word of God. It starts with that truth. It doesn't say, I'm going to pretend that it's not. And then we're going to try and prove that it is. Well, even then, they're going to say that they can't do that. We're going to, we're going to pretend that this is not God's Word. And then I'm going to try and show you that it's reliable to, to believe it. The presuppositional method is going to say, we shouldn't do that. Because if we do that... We're actually trying to be neutral when we're really not. We're really not because we believe we believe what it says. So I think that those are the strengths. What's the weakness? Because there's a weakness. It's a glaring. It's very glaring. When you think about it really hard, it seems like this is circular reasoning. Um, it sounds like it. I believe the Bible because the Bible says so. I'm going to argue with you because the Bible is true. It sounds very circular. So go ahead. How about this, uh 
religion and other beliefs that they made their own by different Bible. Like for example, the Catholic, mm -hmm. they edited the Ten Commandments, those things. So mm -hmm. if you are preaching to a person and then they want to, to have a Bible, so what? How will you tell them? Maybe you can tell them ESV Bible. Yeah. So in those cases, you are going to have to you're going to have to have some knowledge to be able to talk about um, textual criticism. So you will, you'll have to engage in those debates, which is good, but we're still going to do it from a Christian worldview. We're not, going to, we're not going to affirm religious neutrality, and we're not going to affirm human autonomy. That's the key to the presuppositional method. Just deny those two principles, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it. I, mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Are you saying if, he, if we argue the Bible is true because the Bible is true, somebody else says, well, I have a different Bible. Yeah. 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 So we're gonna, we're gonna have to say well, um, the Bible. Is, so we're gonna have to get into textual criticism, and so we're gonna have to argue. Well, we believe that um, God has preserved His Word, and He has preserved His Word. The Catholic has the same scriptures as us in terms of the um, the old new, the old and New Testament. Um, but yet you're right that they do change some things. So, but we're still going to say that the Bible is the word of God and we're going to go back to, we could say, you know, um, we have all these texts, texts, we know um, that they are uh, historically uh, accurate and they go back to the original manuscripts. We have 99% accuracy. So we're going to have to make those arguments, but we're still going to say that we believe the Bible is the word of God and we're going to still have to say that it's not based upon our authority, but it's based upon what God has revealed himself in Scripture and the Holy Spirit has testified in our hearts. So we're still going to have to go to that. Um, let's keep going, though. Um, so circular reasoning, that's the weakness of, this, of presuppositional method. So I want to respond to the objection because I think it is biblical. I think this method is biblical. So I'm going to say that presuppositions are not the same as premises in an argument. So when you make an argument, um, that's different than a presupposition. Um, all worldviews have basic beliefs that function as final authorities. There is a circularity or foundational nature to basic beliefs that is unavoidable. So when someone says that you're circular, you're, you're arguing in a circle, then I would ask them, um, or actually I wouldn't ask them, I would say you are too. And if they say no, I'm not, well, I mean, I can show you um, quickly that they are, right? So I could say, um, I don't know, um, how, do you know how do you know reason, uh, reason leads to truth, right? How do you know reason leads to truth? Do you have to use reason to show that it's true? Yes. Circular reasoning, right? Everyone has to argue in some type of circle or some type. You have to, you have to assume some things is true and then start on that foundation. Everyone has to do that. So the presuppositionalist is not doing something, that, you know, they're not doing something unique that everyone else is not doing. Everybody does this. And so this can't be an argument um, against presuppositionalism because everybody has to do this. So it shouldn't be treated as a good argument. All right, key figures. This is where our notes come in on the back, the very back. So the key figures... So the very back is going to be Cornelius Van Til and Gordon H. Clark. I put down at the very bottom an equal sign that with a slash in it. They are not the same. Their presuppositional, their presuppositional method are not the same. So I don't want to give you the impression that they're the same. They're not. But I do want to say that they have similarities. Okay, And I am more influenced by Clark than I am directly Van Til. Um, just to let you guys know up front that is true but this is helpful so that you kind of get an idea on who influenced who Clark was influenced by St. Augustine um, Cornelius Van Til was influenced by B.B. Warfield and Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bovink and then notice guys look who Cornelius Van Til influenced Francis Schaeffer anybody heard of that name? Yeah, Francis Schaeffer, he's, he's well-known, 20th century, 20th century philosopher. He wrote a lot of books. He influenced a lot of people. And the other individual is John Frame. John Frame has been teaching forever, right? And he has so many books um, that are super thick, right? Um, and then on Clark, 
Some of these individuals are not as well known, but Robert L. Raymond, he's, he's famous, uh, in, at least he's known for his systematic theology. Um, all right, let's keep going, guys. So key figures, um, we're going way past time just because I talked a lot. So I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to go through a scripture, and hopefully we can see some of the elements of the presuppositional method. So let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. And I put a cross-reference as well, um, just so you can look at it. It's, uh, in Matthew, you can see our Lord doing something very similar to the presuppositional method. So Acts chapter 17, uh, what is the context? The Apostle Paul... Uh, during his mi his missionary journey, he was sent away from Berea to Athens due to persecution. In Athens, the Apostle Paul was waiting for Timothy and Silas. And that's where we're picking it up in verses 16 through 34. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Are Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you were presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own, poet, even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from among them from their midst, but some men joined him and believed among them also were, sorry, whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So, um, I mean, there are tons of things we could talk about. I don't have time to give a full exegesis. So I'm going to, I'll send you guys an email, in an email, um, a sermon I gave on this, um, just because we don't have time. So this is what I want to say. Paul's method was not to establish common beliefs with the Greeks. Rather, Paul confronted the Greek worldview with the Christian worldview by demonstrating the necessity of the truth of the Christian worldview. Paul accomplished this by comparing and contrasting and critiquing the Greek worldview. Now, how does he do that? Well... Paul, he says that they affirmed the creator-creature distinction in principle, but denied it in practice. Paul explains the Greeks' walk in self-contradiction. On the one hand, 
the Greeks affirm God is the creator. But on the other hand, they embrace and embody God in worship as a creature, like idols. They paid lip service to God as the creator, but worshiped the creation instead of the creator. That's exactly what they did. And Paul identified that and he exposed that. So I, I think that Paul's approach seems presuppositional. You may disagree with me. Um, we didn't have time to go deep because Paul does talk about the resurrection. I believe he does, but he does that in the context of the Christian worldview. He never divorces it from the Christian worldview. And so I don't think that this would be used to prove the classical method, but I don't have time to argue that. All right, so how can we condense everything that I've said? I think we can simplify the presuppositional method in two principles. The no neutrality principle and the no autonomy principle. If you get these two principles, you can do apologetics and not have to worry about some of the finer details. <coughs> Excuse me. The no neutrality principle denies there is any religious neutrality in apologetics. God has given meaning to all things. There is no thing without a God-given meaning. Everyone either accepts or rejects Christ's lordship. There is, no there is no intellectual neutrality. Jesus says you're either for me or you're against me. There's no middle ground. Yeah. And in the same way, when we're talking about Christianity, you either accept Christianity or you reject it. And I put down in scripture um, proof of this, uh, this principle. The second one is the no autonomy principle. This principle denies there is any human intellectual autonomy in apologetics. Humans do not have the final authority or the right to judge God or scripture independent of what God has said. Scripture is the final authority. God is the final authority. Um, don't have time to quote. Um, I'll just quote John Frame here. Just one quote to kind of give you an idea on how does this work. The Bible does not make this kind, or, or pardon me, okay, let's, let's start over again. John Frame writes, the Bible does, there we go, John Frame says, the Bible does make this kind of radical claim that creation not only implies, but presupposes God. For God is the creator of all, and therefore the source of all meaning, order, and intelligibility. It is in Christ that all things hold together. So without him, without Christ, everything falls apart. Nothing makes sense. Thus scripture teaches that unbelief is foolishness. There are many arguments to be made on the way to that conclusion. Not every individual apologetic argument needs to go that far, but the apologist's work is not done until he reaches that conclusion, until he persuades the objector that God is everything the Bible says he is. So we can use arguments. As Christians, we are to practice apologetics from these two principles. Ideally, every argument we make to defend the faith in some way conforms to these two principles. So use science, use logic, use reason, use philosophy, but make sure that they conform to these two principles. If you can do that, then your apologetical method is going to be able to honor Christ and is going to be able to be consistent with Scripture. All right, so how would we do this? We're going way beyond, so I apologize, guys. We're going way deep, but um, here's the tools to analyze worldviews. Capital letter F, worldview evaluation. So we're going to affirm the Christian worldview, and we're going to compare our worldview to the non-Christian's worldview. The non-Christian is, um, let's give an example, because I don't want to just use atheists. Atheists are easy. All right, let's use somebody different. Let's use a Hindu, right? Hindus believe all is God and God is all, and there is no distinctions. All distinctions are illusory. All distinctions in reality is an illusion. Um, there are no distinctions. Everything is all the same thing, God. All right, so how would we use these tools? Let's see, look at the first tool, consistency. Is the worldview consistent with itself? Does a person have contradictory beliefs? The Hindu. If he says all is Maya and Maya, you know, everything is Maya, okay? So, <coughs> okay, everything is Maya. There, all distinctions are an illusion. 
okay. Okay, then I'm in heaven now. No, you're not. You're, you're, you're not in moksha. You need to follow me and follow the teachings of Hinduism to get in moksha, to, be, to find yourself with one, with God. Right? Okay, well, then I'm in heaven. No, you're not. I am. I must be, because all is one. One is so. This must be heaven. What I'm doing is I'm showing the consistency doesn't work, because their system says you have to follow Hinduism to be able to enter into moksha, which means to become one with God, right? But then they also say that there are no distinctions. Everything is one, and that the distinctions are all an illusion. The material world is an illusion. Okay. So I just said, okay, then I'm in heaven. I showed them there's an inconsistency there. Or I could have done this. Okay, give me your wallet. What do you mean? Give me your wallet. It's an illusion. Give me your wallet. You don't care. Give me your wallet. I'm showing them an inconsistency in their worldview, right? And I actually did that at Chico State. I said, okay, give me your wallet. And he said, no. Right? No. Okay, how about the next one? Coherence. Does the worldview fit together well? Does the part support each other well? Does the part support and explain the other parts? Think of it as like a web. Your beliefs are like a web, and they should all fit together. Um, they should all be uh, consistent and coherent together, and they should fit together well. It's like peanut butter and jelly, right? Um, or, I don't know, um, what's something that goes together that fits well together? That's food, but, you know, it's something that... <coughs> Yeah, here's an example. So an atheist, they believe that everything is material. Everything is physical. So if they tell me that they believe love is immaterial, that's not going to fit well, right? You could say it's inconsistent, but it's also not going to fit well. Their beliefs are not going to fit together well because they're going to have something that's physical and not physical, right? It's going to seem incoherent. All right, the next thing is explanation. Uh, number three, explanation. How can, you know, how much can the worldview explain? Does it have explanatory power and scope? Can it explain just parts of, of the world or does it explain everything? Our worldview explains everything, but some worldviews only explain just part of the world, right? For example, if you have the Greek deities, each deity only explains part of the world, right? Um, Poseidon only explains the sea, and um, Zeus only explains uh, the sky. and <coughs> So these deities are only going to explain part of reality. So they're not going to have good explanatory power. Right? You want a worldview that explains everything, not just part of, part of the world. Experience. Does the world fit with our experience? The Hindu example. The Hindu is saying everything is an illusion. Well... Does that fit with our experience? No, it does not. If I hit a rock, it hurts. If I, um, if I, you know, if I stub my toe, my my toe is different than the ground, and when I stub it, I know that they're different, right? It doesn't fit well with experience. Our conscience. Does the world use ethics resonate with our consciences? Um, uh, what would be an example? Um, we use this term incorrigible, right? It shocks the conscience. If someone told me that, um, I, I know this is a horrible example, but if someone told me that pedophilia is okay, that shocks my conscience. That's wrong, right? That is wrong. Um, so that would be that would be something we want to we want to look at their ethics. Does it shock our conscience, or does it is it consistent with our conscience? Livability. Can one live out this worldview in practice? Um, are the beliefs and behaviors consistent? <coughs> what would be an example of livability? Mm. Well, we can use the example of if you think everything is an illusion, is that livable? If you consistently believed everything is an illusion, could you live that out? Not consistently, you couldn't. It's not livable. You can't get in your car and believe your car doesn't exist. Right? You can't you can't go to work and believe your work doesn't exist. Um, it's the same thing. It, it, you can't be a solipsist. A solipsist is the idea that I'm the only one that exists. I can't be a solipsist because if I was a solipsist, then I can't be talking to you right now, right? You guys wouldn't exist if solipsism was true. Everything would be in my head, right? That's clearly wrong. 
Um, are we in the matrix? That's not livable. Um, we can talk about if that is or not, but I, I don't think it is, but we'll, we'll just keep going. Fulfillment. Does the worldview satisfy our deepest desires and instincts about life? This is very important. Um, we know that God has put in our hearts eternity. And so it feels wrong when we see someone die early. We feel like they're stripped of something. We desire more than this. We desire a life that goes beyond this life, right? And so does, does the worldview fulfill that longing, that desire? The last one is hope. Does this worldview give us real hope? Does it give us salvation? And is that salvation something attainable? Can we actually have it? And then is it by works or is it by grace? If it's by works, then it's unlivable. If it's by grace, we have hope. All right. And then the last part is, um, how could you do this? How can you use this? Um, it's just like the taking the roof off tactic. Let me stand in your shoes for a moment. <coughs> you basically pretend you're, you know, put yourself in their shoes. Use these tools to analyze the worldview. And then you, actually, you, you encourage them, now stand in my worldview for a moment. Get in my shoes and see the Christian worldview is able to fulfill all this. It can satisfy or it is adequate to be able to provide um, consistency, uh, coherence, e explanation, experience, conscience, livability, fulfillment, and hope. Christianity can fulfill all that. All right, so that is going to be all of my notes. <clears throat> I left you some tips. Um, so I do want you guys to check out those tips. I went beyond the time we're scheduled till um, <clears throat> 12, but since nobody is here, um, what I'll do is, any questions about the material that we've discussed here? I know it's a lot. It's a good guide. It's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of information. You don't have to, like I said, I don't want you to feel like you have to memorize all this. <clears throat> what I, the takeaway from this is just the two principles. That's it. No neutrality and no autonomy. If you could just take those two principles and <clears throat> apply them, those are the those are the keys to this. Uh, no neutrality and no neutrality and no autonomy. Okay. Now, by autonomy, that doesn't deny that we have some type of freedom. God, God has given us freedom, so we do make judgments. That's not what this is denying. What it's denying is that we are a law unto ourselves, that we, that we are the measure of all things, that we, um, as I explained it, can judge God, put God, on, put God on, on trial. We don't have that authority. Our authority is limited and delegated by God. God is the final authority. So I, I do want to make that point. Neutrality, um, again, it has to do with new, religious neutrality um, or worldview neutrality. There is nothing in this world that is neutral. Um, even our government is not neutral, right? <laughs> Switzerland is not neutral. Switzerland is not. They have their specific beliefs also. Yeah. If you try to say that you're neutral, the fact that you're trying to argue that you're neutral shows that you're not. <laughs> It does. Um, so, yeah, the, the point of the no autonomy in this case, being autonomy is is the atheistic approach, saying, yeah, yeah, I have everything in my, in my control. And yeah, I'm in control. I, I'm I'm the captain of my ship. Um, you know, <clears throat> everyone must um, bow down to my reason. Um, and if you don't, if you don't satisfy what I think is right, then um, you know, I'm not going to listen to you. Or maybe we could th put it this way. What is the main theme in the book of Judges? Yeah, the book of Judges. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Yes. Doing what is right in your own eyes is exactly what autonomy is. That's exactly what autonomy is. Doing what is right in your own eyes, not doing what it, not caring about God, doing what is right in your own eyes. That is the epitome of autonomy. And we need to reject that. 
God is our king, not anybody else. Perfect. So that's the that's the main thrust of the apologetic method. Um, so don't get bogged down with all the details or the schools or the methods. You don't need to really worry too much about that. Now, I, I, last part, books. Everyone wants to know, Ryan, what books, what, what books do you recommend? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I got books upon books upon books. No. Okay, so here's some books, guys. <clears throat> so, if you want to question me, which I encourage you to, I, I told you a lot of the material is from James and Anderson. Okay, I use a lot of his material. So if you don't think, you know, you want to check me and make sure I'm right, get this book and look at the other methods. Okay, I would encourage you that. Now, I, I told you I, I like Gordon Clark a lot. So Gordon Clark has a book called A Christian View of Men and Things. I recommend this book. Christian View, it's called A Christian View of Men and Things by Gordon H. Clark. Now, if you're a person that doesn't like apologetics, like you, don't, you, you find it dry, then get his biology or his biography. Get his biography. Um, you can get Gordon Clark's biography by Douglas uh, Dalma. And the reason why it's authorized is because his his daughters helped with it. Um, obviously, this was written post um, post yeah po po after his death. Um, but <clears throat> you can get his biography to learn more about him if you're interested. Um, if if you want to look at uh, Cornelius Van Til. I love arguments back and forth. Cornelius Van Til, here's a, um, I, I don't know if this is his, fre his uh, fray shift or whatever, like, but um, there's a book called Jerusalem and Athens. And this book is basically scholars critique uh, Van Til and then Van Til responds to them. So if you're interested in Van Til, yeah. But he has a little booklet that you can get online called My Credo. I recommend you read that. It's called My Credo. You could get it online, my credo. And then, uh, no, no, he is, he's passed away. All these men were prominent in like the 50s. Um, like Gordon Clark, he got his PhD in 1929, 1930, and he started teaching. He taught at Wheaton and he taught at Butler University. Uh, Cornelius Van Til, he taught at um, Westminster Theological Seminary. Um, and uh, both of them are... Yeah, both of them have influenced me in some way. Um, Clark probably a little more than Clark more than Van Til, but Van Til um, <clears throat> Frame has written this book called a um, Cornelius Van Til: An Analysis of His Thought. Um, so, if you wanted to uh, dig into Van Til, um, I would recommend looking at some of what Frame says because Frame is going to be he's going to be charitable, but he's also going to be critical, which is good. So he's going to He's going to tell you where he where he thinks is Van Til is right and where he thinks Van Til is wrong. And then the last book, which which I recommended as a, kind of a, the text to buy, like the textbook on apologetics, is John Frame's book Apologetics: um, A Justification of Christian Belief. Um, you can get the this is the newer public published uh, version. You could get the old one. It's called Apologetics to the Glory of God. It's going to be probably cheaper, but this one's going to be better because it has uh, has more material in it. So those are going to be some books I recommend. Um, on the classical apologetic side, I would recommend uh, I'd recommend William Lane Craig's book "Reasonable Faith." Reasonable Faith by uh, William Lane Craig. He also has an excellent website. So Reasonablefaith.org. Yeah, if you go to this website. Right. Yes. So that's going to be, that's right. Reasonablefaith.org is going to be very helpful uh, to look at uh, uh, his material. William Lane Craig. It's in your notes. It is in your notes. Uh, it's going to be under, um, flip it over, it's under the classical method. So if you go under. Um, Capital letter D, um, number one. Yeah, so he does, he, he's going to hold to a, a, an old earth 
He's an old earther. Yeah, he's an old earther. Well, he's gonna say he's gonna be like, a, yeah, it's it's old earth. Right, that's Genesis. Yeah. I don't know. I know a lot of Christians who don't believe Genesis. I don't know any of the other Christians who don't believe other Old Testament books. I wasn't aware of the school of thought. There's some. I think. Moses or prophets. I know, like, 